Oh boy. Oh what's, boy. What's that smell? What is that? that? Definite weekend aroma. It does, it? doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. And it smells sweet. A little tinge of smoke though. Yeah. I don't like that. No, we don't it. like that. No. Happy Friday, everybody. It is the 20th day of July, 2018. I am Dan Coons, your host, and this is Wake Up Anche Valley. Thanks for starting your day with us, and your weekend is almost here. And we're going to get you going the right way with uh, news, information, entertainment, and whatever else we happen to cram into our Friday program. Dan Coons, Steve Harris, news director. Uh, to my immediate left, we have a lot of news to get to. It was a busy day in the newsroom, all up at fire related. A lot of stuff going on right now. Cat uh -huh. in control. Skip Moore, Chelan County Auditor Skip Moore is standing by. It's election day. It's, well, no, it isn't. But it is too. <laughs> election day day well, when you're is voting, August uh, When you're 7th. voting, it makes it election day. But I mean, well, when you vote, yeah, yeah I suppose yeah. so. Uh, you can vote now. Most people, uh, I live in Chelan County. I got my ballot yesterday. Did you get your ballot, Douglas County guy? Not yet. Okay, you'll get it next couple of days. The Skip Moore, Chelan County Auditor, will be in to talk about some of the changes happening for the primary election. There's quite a bit of it. We, uh, for the record, we invited his cohort from the east side of the river, uh, Douglas County Auditor Thad Duvall. Thad is spending some quality time with family and uh, begged out of visiting us, but that's cool. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Skip will fill you in all the, all the information you need so you can be an informed voter. As uh, Steve mentioned, we mentioned we got some fires uh, going on. Nothing really big, but still stuff you oh, need to yeah. know about. So, Basin especially. Yeah, uh, lots going on there. Uh, that reminds me right now, I-90 uh, near the, uh, uh, what they're calling the Boylston fire is still closed in both directions. But unlike a couple of weeks ago when we had a fire in that Vantage Kittitas area and they had to shut down I-90 with no detours, there are detours available yeah. for this fire. So you can still get through. You have to add another 15 minutes or so if you're planning to go that direction because you're going to take you on some local roads and around and then back onto I-90. Um, but uh, that one stretch of I-90 is still closed in both directions, but you can at least get through. You just have to add some extra We're time. We're doing a status report on that other fire that's burning, the Buckshot fire, which is the Kittitas fire, and, the, and then the, uh, the, uh, the Buckshot fire in Douglas, or rather Grant County near mm -hmm. Desert Air, and that closed uh, Highway 243 for a period of time, but that's been reopened. Oh, good, good. So needless to say, that will be our top story. We have some fire stuff. we got sports. Uh, Mariners go back to work. Apple Sox are already back to work. We'll talk about that. I also preview all the activities going on this weekend. The obscure holiday today mm -hmm. in history. Birthdays, everybody is entitled to Mike Magnotti's opinion. And I'm in a really good mood because I'll be on assignment all next yes, week. Yes, you will be going yes. on vacation. Yeah, I need it too. I'm looking forward to that. Eric will be filling in for me next week on Wake Up in Anche Valley. I hope I'm not Wally Pip. Just don't Wally Pip me. And no. I'll be happy. There no. you go. It's three minutes after the hour. Let's go around the valley with our Valley View cameras. That this is the east um, uh, cross camera, the lower cross camera, Steve, not the main cross camera. This camera is about 200 yards to the east of the camera that we normally use. It's also a little bit, whoa, a little oh, bit lower. No, and we're like zooming it. right on in to the Senator George Seller Bridge. The morning commute looks pretty quiet right now. The breeze has kind of died down a little bit. Uh, they're judging by the flag on the Seller Bridge. But the, then I've just been... Yeah. <laughs> now we start to get some shaping. Huh? Uh, we do have a red flag warning, by the way. It starts at 11 o'clock this morning, goes until 9 o'clock tonight. The same scenario applies, Steve. Warm temperatures, although cooler than the last couple of days, still going to be warm, going to be windy, and low relative humidity, about 12 to 25 percent. And now we make a slow dissolve to the Arondo Rock camera. All of these cameras, courtesy of Local Tail SkyFi High Speed Wireless. Arondo Rock is to your lower right. And I think Kat's going to move this baby as well. I have a feeling, oh, she's not going to move it. Okay, but that's still, beautiful view there. Lovely. You can still see, see way up there in the upper right-hand corner, you can see a little bit of that haze. Yeah, from, and we're, we're going to get a better shot of that here in a few minutes because we do have uh, fires uh, burning in the Chelan area. Uh, Navarra Cooley, they had one earlier this morning that's in mop-up and another fire here that you can see uh, up on uh, South Lakeshore near Fields Point landing and that fire is uh, currently burning this is a live shot looking uh, north up lake and again we'll have more details on that coming up in a few minutes good shot there cat and that gives you an idea of how windy it is again these cameras are way up in elevation and they're also exposed to the elements so it can it sometimes will be exaggerated because we're zoomed in so far even the slightest motion mm -hmm. will make that camera move so that might be a, a bit disingenuous it might not be actually that windy it's just that the camera zoomed in so much is very susceptible to motion but you can see there uh, on the lake there it's uh, some rippled water that uh, an indication that the winds are buffeting that fire and finally, camera number four is a look at hmm. something. 
<laughs> look at something. That's that's good, Dan. I'm so proud of myself. Oh, okay. Uh, Billy Goat. That's Billy Goat. Yep, we're zooming out to Billy Goat. Ooh. That's a great shot that's there. That's a dramatic shot there with the sun shining down on the river. And you can see Canada. Hi, Canada. How are you? That little bump in the screen, right smack dab in the middle. Mount Kalispell, Kalispell spelt with a C, is about 25 miles north of the Canadian border. That's how high up that camera is. That's in the Canadian Rockies. Really spectacular stuff. Good work this morning, Cat. Wonderful. Yeah, good stuff indeed. And again, we'll have the latest on uh, the fires, the two fires that came out of nowhere in the overnight hours and the early morning hours. Steve will have that in just a couple of minutes. Let's do your weather forecast from the National Weather Service. Red flag warning will kick in again at 11 o'clock this morning till 9 o'clock tonight uh, because of the winds. Yesterday's high 91, Steve, going to be cooler today, only 86. In fact, we're off to a cool start, uh, 61 degrees outside of our studios. That's not bad at all. Our overnight low was in the 50s, so we, we got down there a little mm -hmm. bit. Uh, but again, the red flag warning is the big story today because of the wind. Not so much wind today, Steve. Northwest wind pretty consistent around 15 miles an hour. It's actually going to pick up an in intensity tonight. Uh, northwest wind about 17 miles an hour. Gusts uh, bumping up about 20 to 25 miles an hour tonight. And then the wind goes away and we begin another warming process. One more day of 86, so today 86 and tomorrow 86. And then Sunday, here comes the heat again. 90 to 95 to 97 to 97 to 97. And no wind in the forecast. Sunny, dry, hot is your forecast beginning in other words, Sunday. We're gonna 86 the 86. We're gonna 86 the 86. Yeah, That's yeah. really good, Steve. Once again, red flag warning at 11 o'clock this morning to 9 o'clock for most of our viewing area. It's the same scenario we talked about, low relative humidity, strong winds, warm temperatures. So the potential for fires anyway is out there. If any fire gets going and they don't hop on it right away, it could really, really take off. They've been jumping on them in a hurry here yep. these fires this early season. It's lucky we've got the resources to do it. On Fridays, we normally have five pounds worth of news in a four pound bag, and by golly, that's going to be the case, so we're not going to waste any more time. We're going to take a quick one minute break, and then Steve Harris is going to give you the information you need to start your Friday off the right way. And the news is brought to you by our friends at Cascade Medical. Trained with a physical therapist who loves the outdoors as much as you do, Cascade Medical partners in your health. The physical therapists at Cascade Medical love the outdoors as much as you do. But sometimes where there's love, there's also pain. Let us help you get back to the activities that you love. Cascade Medical, partners in your health. Join me for Life with Lisa Bradshaw on NCW Life. It's not about my life, it's about yours. And now it's time for your local news update with Steve Hare. Good morning and welcome back to the program. And on this 20th day of July, here's what's happening around North Central Washington. We're waking up to more brush fires this morning in North Central Washington. Crews in Chelan County responded to two wind-fueled brush fires early this morning in the Chelan area. The two fires went to three alarms this morning. The first reported in Navarre Cooley Road area, Highway 971 near milepost 7 west of Chelan. A second blaze is currently burning along South Lakeshore Drive. Now here's a, a shot of it uh, taken earlier this morning. Again, the fires were first reported in the 4 o'clock hour. We're being told that the Navarre Cooley fire is now in mop-up, but the fire we're looking at right now, the South Lakeshore fire, was reportedly burning near Fields Point Landing. At last report, it had crested the hill with crews from Chelan County Fire Districts 5, 7, and 8 responding. This is a live shot now looking at that fire, uh, which uh, the smoke is uh, heading up slope there from the uh, Lakeshore Drive area. At last report, it had crested the hill, uh, again with uh, three fire districts rep uh, responding. Level two notices were issued for homes in that Fields Point Landing area. Uh, both fires were estimated at about two acres each in size, but 
since that report uh, was received here about an hour ago, they've probably grown from there. But again, the Navarre Cooley Road, 971, remains open. That fire was in mop-up. And again, crews are still uh, fighting that blaze along South Lakeshore Drive. And that section of the roadway near Fields Point Landing has been closed until further notice. Also, Interstate 90 remains closed this morning in both directions by a wind-fanned wildfire in Kittitas County. The so-called Boylston Fire broke out yesterday afternoon, spread to over 3,000 acres. A second major brush fire continues to threaten homes in the desert air community of Grant County. The Buckshot Fire is now a state mobilization effort involving crews from all over the state, including Chelan and Douglas County crews. The Southeast Washington Incident Management Team is overseeing the suppression efforts. Crews on the ground are receiving air support from three fixed-wing aircraft and two DNR helicopters. The images we're seeing here were provided to us by the Kittitas County Sheriff's Department. I-90 closed eastbound seven miles east of Kittitas and westbound at the Vantage Bridge. Traffic is being detoured onto the Vantage Highway, so there's a way around it. Uh, the Washington State DOT has also announced SR-243 has reopened after it was closed in both directions last night. In that fire, the Buckshot Fire, Level 3 evacuation notices were issued for Oval Fruit Company in Gettys Cove. Level 2 notices for Wanapum State Park. Deputies have contacted people in those areas to advise them of fire activity. And again, I-90 remains closed in both directions, and there's no estimated time for reopening that stretch of highway. Site preparation work continues on the site of the future downtown Wenatchee Fire Station for Chelan County Fire District 1, the property that was formerly occupied by Prospector Pies Restaurant along uh, Wenatchee Avenue, currently fenced off as uh, the district prepares to contract out the demolition of that old building, Deputy Fire Chief Mike Burnett explained. So we're really close with going out for bid. Um, it's in preliminary uh, plan review with the city to make sure that there's no surprises. Last thing we'd want to do is send it out for bid, get all our bids back, and then find out that we missed something with the, the city. Uh, and so they'll review the plan first, make sure that we're in compliant with everything that they're going to require of us, and then it'll go out for bid. So. Our, our hope is that by August the 1st, it'll be out to, out to bid. Now, the district also nearing completion on its new Station 13 facility. It's located at the bottom of Squilchuck Road. Burnett will be retiring in February and is currently helping new fire chief Brian Brett with his transition. Recovering from a devastating wildfire is the subject of a reunion and a celebration taking place through Sunday for communities affected by the massive Carlton Complex fire of 2014 and uh, the uh, record-breaking Okanagan wildfires of 2015. Okanagan County Long-Term Recovery Group was formed following the fires and provides services, rebuilds homes, and works to ensure that Okanagan County communities are adequately prepared to handle future disasters. Activities for the five-day event include a smoke and mirrors fire maze display which includes a mini-museum to take viewers on a tour of the damage caused by both fire events, a rebuild tour of homes being built, and a ride from the Ashes Dinner and Concert. Uh, the event begins at 5.30 with a barbecue at the Chelan Riverfront Park. In July of 2014, the over 250,000-acre Carlton Complex fire started out as four separate fires that merged into the single largest fire in the state's history as it uh, roared through Pateras and destroyed more than 350 homes. Okanagan Complex and Chelan Complex fires of 2015 burned almost 400,000 acres, making them the largest in state history. Well, the public is invited to submit their comments on a draft plan from the Forest Service to relocate mountain goats from the Olympic Mountains to the North Cascades. Olympic Mount Baker Snoqualmie and Okanagan Wenatchee National Forest are opting for uh, the so-called Alternative D uh, from an environmental impact study to reduce the mountain goat population in the Olympics as they're not native to that area. The plan also includes the lethal removal of the remaining mountain goats in that park. According to officials, numbers in the Cascades are low and moving the goats will increase diversity and provide them with a more preferred habitat. 
The Forest Service released the record of decision in June and will make a final decision following the objection period. Now, the National Park Service will begin the coordinated process for capture and relocation operations later this summer. Any objections to the plan can be submitted via mail or electronically. You can visit our website at ncwlife.com for the online links to submit your comments. Well, a bipartisan group of lawmakers in Congress have introduced legislation to replace the H-2A Foreign Agricultural Guest Worker Program. Co-sponsor, 4th District Congressman Dan Newhouse, says the Ag and Legal Workforce Act replaces what he described as the outdated and broken program with a new H-2C program. Now, it would be made available to both seasonal and year-round agricultural employees. Newhouse claimed the bill ensures farmers and ranchers will have access to a reliable workforce in the future. It will provide a, a, uh, an ability to bring legal status to the current workforce and also be able to bring uh, legally a source of workers for the agricultural industry uh, if necessary from outside the country. And so um, th but and then, then another important facet of this is also uh, imposing the electronic verification system uh, that would be a requirement for employers to use to verify that employees in fact do have legal status in the country, which you know is is also a very important factor in um, immigration reform. Proponents claim the bill's provisions are supported by over 200 agricultural groups, including the American Farm Bureau Federation. One final note here, happened to spot this yesterday, a popular East Wenatchee eatery and watering hole has closed its doors for good. The sign outside the Clearwater Saloon, Casino and Steakhouse reads, permanently closed. The business takes up almost the entire block along Valley Mall Parkway. No explanation immediately available from ownership as to why they closed, but it certainly received quite a response on our Facebook post yesterday. Mm -hmm. It was a surprise to some employees. Yeah, <coughs> as I understand, they're all looking for jobs now. Have an update on the I-90 closure because of the Boylston fire, Steve. I-90 is open westbound now. Good. All it right. is open westbound. Eastbound remains closed and will be closed according to the Washington State Department of Transportation for probably most of the day today. But westbound, which is good, that's from here to there, mm -hmm. is now open. You can get through I-90 through the Vantage, Kittitas, Ellensburg area. Eastbound traffic from Puget Sound area to our area yes. is closed and will remain closed, they say, till at least 4 o'clock this afternoon. Good news for you truckers out there. Absolutely. Uh, boy, busy news day. I can't imagine what's, what's going to happen at 5 o'clock tonight. I hope we can cram it all in. Well, we've got a lot of news to cover, definitely. We, we do have a lot of news yeah, to cover. We didn't even have a chance to, uh, to do our little piece on yesterday's uh, candidate forum at the Pibus Public Market. And that was for those two legislative seats that are, uh, are going to be uh, decided in November. Actually, December, uh, August, we've got the primary. Yeah, it's, it's in fact, Skip Moore, Shalane County Auditor, Martin. is my guest in the second half of the program. There's a lot to talk about with Skip. Uh, if you live in Chelan County, you're, you either got your ballot in the mail yesterday, right. it'll come today or on, on Saturday, and you got a lot of homework to do because unlike most uh, August primaries are kind of sleepy and quiet and we kind of punch our ticket and just wait for November, you, there's a lot on this ballot for the, for the August primary. And you can meet some of those uh, candidates up close and personal. We've interviewed quite a few of them here on NCW Live and we've posted those interviews to our website at ncwlive.com, so inform yourself and uh, make use of the website to learn more about the candidates. Yeah, the website's there for you to peruse, in fact, bookmark it, yeah. and use it all the time. You know, we refresh it, we populate it all the time. ncwlife.com, it's got news, it's got sports, it's got weather, you can watch shows on demand, uh, like this show, uh, if you just if you missed it and you want to watch it again, or maybe an interview that you thought might have been informative entertainment, you can watch it whenever you want to. Uh, all of our shows are And it's are interactive, too. You can yeah. talk to us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, in fact, that's one of the great tools that we have for you to get a hold of us is our website, our Facebook page, doing the honors, our news director, Steve Hare. Again, ncwlive.com, that website, a great way to get in touch with us. Just click the little tab at the top of the page there. Also, Facebook and Twitter, as always, those digital sources of uh, communication. News at ncwlive.com, that's the address for our email, so contact us that way if you have a story or event you'd like us to cover. And then, as always, our breaking news hotline. If you see news happening, call 888-6295. That's 888-NCW-LIFE. 
63 degrees, a little breezy. Red flag warning from 11 this morning until 9 o'clock tonight. Going to be windy this afternoon, windy tonight. The winds die down, the heat comes up. Once we get through this red flag warning at 9 o'clock tonight, we're not going to be dealing with any wind, but it's going to really start warming up. Again, another heat wave is coming our way, and of course, things are pretty baked out as it is. So. Yeah, folks, take it easy out there, please, please. 20 minutes after the hour, sports, the obscure holiday. Today in history, birthdays, everyone is entitled to Mike McNaughty's opinion on my conversation with Skip Morris still to come your way between now and 8 o'clock. You're watching Wake Up on Anchee Valley live this morning from Studio 2 in downtown Wenatchee on the NCW Life Channel. I'm Grant Olson, and you're watching the NCW Life Channel. I'm Eric Grandstrom with NCW Life Sports. I'm NCW Life News Director Steve Hess. Catch us on Local Tell Channel 12. You can watch us on Charter Channel 19 or stream us live on ncwlife.com. Follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook. Where we cover the local high schools, the Wenatchee Wild, and the pro teams out of Seattle. On Saturday, we have a 90% chance of rain. Catch it all right here on the NCW Life Channel. Did you know that our pets can put on extra weight just like us? Obesity is the most common preventable disease in dogs and cats. Your pet's excess weight can lead to health issues like joint pain, arthritis, diabetes, high blood pressure, and more. Dr. Shauna Bayes and the staff at Paws and Claws Veterinarian Hospital care about your pets, and they can help you keep them lean and healthy. Call Paws and Claws today at 888-PAWS or find them on the corner of 4th and Isle in East Wenatchee. Welcome back to this Friday edition of Wake Up in Anchee Valley. I'm Dan Koontz. Let's get you the latest in the world of sports, the toy box of the news department. Sam Nowitzki's, I'm sorry, Sam Nowitzki's two-run base hit at the top of the six innings, snapped a 3-3 tie and propelled Portland to a 5-3 win over the Apple Sox. Game one of a doubleheader last night at Paul Thomas Senior Field. And it was a twin bill because they had a rainout uh, in Portland back in June, so they had to make the games up yesterday. The Pickles grabbed the early lead thanks to bases to a bases loaded, loaded throwing error with a little by one edge's third baseman, Jake Taylor. That allowed three runs to score in the third inning, but the Apple Sox came back, scored a run in the bottom of the third, and two more to tie it in the fourth. The one-two from Roth, taking off from first is McCord. The throw gets away from everyone, and in the score will, will be Sage. So the double steal attempt works to perfection. McCord swipes second, and coming in to score is Sage. That will be due to, I believe, a throwing error that will allow Sage to come in. Sailor on deck right now. The pitch. Tapper left side, and that's going to get into the outfield. The RBI single by Corey Meyer ties it up 3-3 in the bottom of the fourth inning. Marquez in some trouble. First inning of work and relief of Spellacy. It's a high ball game, but we'll see how long that lasts. This is hit up the middle for a base hit. Coming in to score is Edson. Right behind him getting the wave is Perez, and he will score easily. 5-3, Portland. And the Sox got runs, a singular run in the third and two in the fourth. Hit over to third. Fielded by Perez. And like the game's final score, the final putout goes 5-3. Joel Norman with a call on the Apple Sox Radio Network. Video courtesy of the Apple Sox Facebook page. So Apple Sox drop game one on to game two of the doubleheader. And just like in game one, Portland got on the board first. Portland ended up winning 3-2. Once again, Joel Norman and the video courtesy of the Apple Sox Facebook page. Good for his second strike out of the game. Runner takes off. Ball's hit in the air to right field. A long way. Moving back toward the fence is Dawson Day. And he won't get that one. A two-run homer for Noah Cardenas. His first of the season. And it's 2 to nothing Portland in the top of the second. Cardenas goes the opposite way to put Portland on the board. It's hit in the air very hard to center field straight away and that ball is over the fence for a home run Cody Darcy first pitch swinging to the deepest part of the ballpark Southpaw deals a little flare into right field and it's going to get down Magro with the base hit. Barrera is waved around, and he will come in to score easily. We got a tie ball game, 2-2 in the fifth. The southpaw kicks and delivers. 
Swung on, hit hard in the air to right center field. Moving back is Day, and that ball is over the fence for a home run. Perez leads off the seventh inning with a solo shot to give the Portland Pickles a 3-2 lead. A chance to redeem himself. He allowed a solo home run to lead off the top of the inning. First pitch, swinging, hits over first base side. It's gloved by Barnum, and he'll step on first. And that's how the ball game ends. A lot of home runs last night. The wind was blowing out of Paul Thomas Senior Field. Noah Cardenas' two-run home run, as you saw in the second, gave the Pickles the early lead. The Apple Sox came back in the third with a solo home run by Cody Darcy. You saw that as well. Wenatchee tied it in the fifth on an RBI base hit by Joey Magro, but then Portland's Mike Perez untied it with a solo home run in the top of the seventh inning. And there you have it. When H and Portland wrap up their series tonight at 7.05, and then they travel to Yakima when they'll take on the Yakima Valley Pippins. Les Schwab scoreboard uh, activity last night in the West Coast League. Uh, Kelowna got past Ben. The final there was 9-3. to three. Uh, It was a doubleheader because we talked about the whole sprinkler situation, so they had to play uh, rain, a sprinkler delay game first. Again, Kelowna got past, past Ben in the first game, and then the Falcons went again 5-4 to four in the actually regularly scheduled game. Yakima Valley took care of Port Angeles. The final there, 9-2. to two. Bellingham broke open a 2-2 tie with a couple of runs in the top of the eighth. They got by Walla Walla, 4-2. to two. And Victoria, the Harbor Cats over Corvallis, 11-5. All of those League games. There was one non league game. Cowlitz got past Northwest Hawkers. Two to nothing. West Coast schedule for today. You see it on your screen. Kelowna will host Ben. Corvallis is at Victoria. Walla Walla hosts Bellingham. Port Angeles continues at Yakima Valley when Anchi finishes their series with Portland. And Cowlitz will take on, once again, the Northwest Hawkers, <clears throat> which is just fun to say. There's your weekend schedule. The Renton Firefighters host their annual Last Alarm Softball Tournament. It runs tomorrow and Sunday at Walla Walla Point Park. Uh, go out and thank the firefighters for all they do. They get a nice little weekend, and we hope they have a nice little weekend to play some softball. It's a huge game. The winner of this game is going to determine the season champion of the Western Washington Football Alliance. It happens Saturday night. Lee Boftel Field of the Apple Bowl. Tri-City Rage, 9-0. The Wenatchee Rams, 7-0. The winner wins the crown. 6 o'clock kickoff Saturday night at Lee Bofto Field. Don't miss this one. And Chelan Man is back this weekend at Lake Chelan. Saturday's events feature a long course triathlon, half marathon, and Olympic triathlon. Then on Sunday, it's a sprint, the tri-tri, uh, youth triathlon, and the splash in dash. And Mariners. All-Star break is over. It's back at work today. They're at home at Safeco Field taking on the Chicago White Sox. Of course, they sputtered to end the first half of the season. They lost eight of their last 11 games. James Shields will start for the White Sox. The Mariners will go with late Wade LeBlanc. The roof will be open. First pitch at <coughs> 7-10. That's sports. At 28 minutes after the hour, it's time for the obscure holiday, which ties a little bit into our Today in History that's coming up in just a little bit. Today is Space Exploration Day because this is the anniversary of the moon landing. July 20th, 1969, when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin became the first human beings to step for foot on the moon. It's Space Exploration Day. It's also Moon Day, so learn about the moon, learn about space. The moon has only been walked on by 12 people, all American males, as you've probably figured that out. And the moon, of course, has no atmosphere. Um, that means it's unprotected from cosmic rays, meteorites, solar winds. It'll just pound right into it. Uh, the lack of atmosphere means there's no sound on the moon, and the sky always appears to be jet black. There you go. Happy Moon Day. Happy Space Exploration Day. Today in history, at 29 minutes after the hour, happy birthday to the very first freeway in California history. The Arroyo Seco Parkway opened to connect connected downtown Los Angeles to Pasadena, California. The very first freeway in California history opened on this day, July 20th, 1940, 78 years ago, and it was such a big hit they have since built, built 312 more freeways. There are 312 freeways in the state of California. That's a lot, but the very first one is 78 years old today. As we mentioned this, July 20th, 1969, men walked on the moon. The Sea of Tranquility was the location. Uh, they landed on the moon, and then they waited a little over six hours before Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong eventually popped on out and took a look-see around, and poor Michael Collins, he was just rotating around uh, the moon, waiting for the guys to get done. Michael Collins must have been the loneliest man ever, you would assume.
man walked on the moon 49 years ago today. And 42 years ago today, July 20th, 1976, that is a still frame in the bottom of the seventh inning. Hank Aaron hit a first pitch fastball from Dick Drago of the Anaheim Angels over the left center field wall at County Stadium in Milwaukee. It was his 755th and final home run. He would still play another two and a half months with the Milwaukee Brewers before he retired, but he never hit another home run. Number 755, the last of Hank Aaron's career, was hit on the state 42 years ago. And to me, it's still the record. 30 minutes after the hour. Uh, birthday, Sir Edmund Hillary, the New Zealand Mountaineer, the first guy to make it all the way to the top of the world. He and, of course, Tenzing Norgay made it to the top of Mount Everest on the 29th day of May, 1953. The first man to do it. Sir Edmund Hillary was born in the state of 1919, died at the age of 88 in 2008. Carlos Santana, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Oyo Komova, got a black magic woman, uh, Supernatural, the great Carlos Santana, he's, he's a legend, and he plays really good guitar. Carlos is 71 years old today. And speaking of a guy who played really good guitar, we miss this guy, Chris Cornell. Of course, he was with Soundgarden, one of my favorite Seattle bands of the early 70s, an audio slave, uh, took his own life last year. Chris Cornell, uh, the great guitarist, was born in the state in 1964. It would have been 54 years old today, 31 minutes after the hour. Everybody is entitled to Mike McNaughty's opinion. Got a good one for you today. You're going to be reminded of Mike's Italian heritage. Trust me on that one. And then a great conversation with Skip Moore. You don't want to miss this. Shalane County Auditor Skip Moore will be dropping by because it's time to start voting for the August 7th primary. Ballots are either in your mailbox or in the mail. Skip Moore coming up. You're watching Wake Up in Anchee Valley on the NCW Life Channel. I have a doctor who knows what they're talking about. It's just so much more hands-on and friendly than anywhere else I've ever been. It's really great to walk into somewhere where you feel welcomed and you feel accepted. We've just been grateful for the care and respect that we've been given there. And here when I come to visit my doctor, I'm not afraid to ask questions. It's not just about getting you in and out. I love my care, it's CVCH, it's awesome. Give it a try. <laughs> Stoke is a series that highlights a variety of outdoor adventure sports that are available in the Pacific Northwest. I dedicate my time to enjoying this natural playground. The decision is yours. How will you keep your Stoke? Hi, Justin here, owner of Club Crow Bar and Grill in Cashmere. Club Crow is your place for famous blues, brews, and barbecue. We are your one-stop bar and grill, serving breakfast, lunch, and dinner seven days a week. Looking for a fun night out? Join us at Club Crow Saturday nights. We have live bands to rock the night away. Club Crow is bringing comedy to Cashmere. Check out our Facebook page for upcoming dates. Live jam session first Sunday of every month. Club Crow Bar and Grill in Cashmere, the coolest place in town. Oh, hey, Nate. What you doing there? I'm just reading a book. A book? I didn't even know they made those anymore. Where'd you get it? Right down the street at Yield Bookshop. Yield Bookshop, I'm gonna go check it out. If you're looking for a good book to read or you're in the market for some beautiful handcrafted creations from local artisans, look no further than Yield Bookshop right in the heart of downtown Wenatchee. So Pam, how's your mom doing? She's okay. She's struggling. She'd like to stay in her house, and it's getting harder for her to do the daily chores. What kinds of problems is she having? Just basic house cleaning, you know, uh, taking care of her house, yard work, taking care of her medicine. Mm -hmm. It does sound exhausting. It is very exhausting, and I always worry about her. Aging in adult care can assist you or your loved one to remain comfortably and safely in their own home. Contact them today to start the conversation. Hey there, Wenatchee. I'm Sean Lee, and I'm inviting you to come down and check out what we're all about at Badger Mountain Brewing. Great beer, good food, and an endless source of entertainment for the whole family. Our Honey Blonde beer is flying off the shelves at your local grocery store. But I tell you what, it's even better on tap. And while you're here, try our signature Badger sauce with one of our delicious meals. 
Whether you're in the mood for a wrap, salad, pizza, or nachos, Badger Mountain Brewing has what you're looking for. Hey, this is Mike Mad Dog McNaughty, and everybody's entitled to my opinion. Now, okay, I need to know. Does my wife Rosie have some kind of superpower? It seems like everywhere I'm about to go, she either gets there first or gets in my way. Now, the other day I was about to get a paper towel, and as soon as I turned in that direction, she got between me and the paper towel dispenser. Uh, and she put something in the trash. I mean, you, know, you know, another time I just turned to go to into our kitchen computer, and as I headed there, she got in front of me, already sitting down at the desk. You know, and it's not just in our home where this happens, it's everywhere. And not only that, just I'm about to do something, like open a window. She says to me, Mike, open the window. <laughs> this happens all the time. No, I need to know, does, does every wife do this? I really think I need to report this to someone. I mean, this is a miracle. This is Mike Mad Dog Magnati, and that's my opinion. Vominos Junk Haulers are pleased to announce they've added moving services to their list of ways to make your life easier. Vominos Moving Service. No move is too big or small. In fact, Vominos does it all. Vominos employees are experienced at moving your home, office, business, and storage. They'll carefully load and unload your belongings. And for the do-it-yourselfers, Vominos also rents trucks and cargo trailers. Call Vominos Junk Haulers and Moving Service today to schedule your free estimate. Boating is a great way to bring family and friends together. At Bob File Boats and Motors, they have the boats for any lifestyle, fishing, wakeboarding, or just relaxing on the water. Buying a new boat is more affordable than you might think at Bob File Boats and Motors, online at bobfile.com or on Sunset Highway in East Wenatchee. Bob File Boats and Motors, we're dealing. Bob File's got to make you smile. to celebrate every season with award-winning dining, full-service spa, and 170 waterfront guest rooms. Come experience our tradition of hospitality at Campbell's Resort on Lake Chelan. When you call Dick's Heating and Air Conditioning, you get 35 years of experience and customer service in the Wenatchee Valley. Dick's friendly staff strongly believe in repairing before replacing and service all major brands of HVAC units. Dick's Heating and Air Conditioning is your local, independent, trained comfort specialists, proudly serving all of North Central Washington. Call 884-6444 today. And we are back on Wake Up Wenatchee Valley. It is election time. Again, the primary election, the actual date is on Tuesday, August 7th, but if you live in Chelan or Douglas County or anywhere in our area, you're going to get one of these in the mail if you haven't already. Whenever we head into an election cycle, we always invite our friends from both Douglas and Chelan County Auditor's Office, as I mentioned at the top of the hour. Uh, Thad Duvall is spending some quality time. Thad Duvall, Douglas County Auditor, is spending some quality time with his family. Good for Thad. He deserves it. But his cohort from Chelan County, Skip Moore, making yet another appearance. Hi, Skip. How are you? I'm great. Glad to be here. It's good to see you again. I love the tie. Yeah, I love the tie. Uh, so here's what you got if you got your thing. I'm not going to show you my actual, you know, this because it has my address on it, but you'll have this. You're sending it back in the mail. You get your, your little yellow piece of paper reminding you that the top two move on. Top two move and on. And the candidate picks the party. The party doesn't pick the candidate. That's, Correct. That's terribly important. And, of course, maybe the most important thing of all, your ballot, and it is a big one this year. And lots to choose from, lots of homework to do. Skip, first thing out of the top. Um, no postage necessary if mailed in the United States. Uh, talk about the process of uh, if you mail your ballot in. Uh, from now, moving forward, you don't have to put a stamp on it anymore. Well, that's what it's going to be. Uh, okay. Once uh, it started out as uh, we, it looked as though a few counties were going to just do it themselves. And the concern there was, 
Well, now if you have one county that's decided to pay for post return postage, you start breaking up legislative districts. So let's say like the the eighth, you have one county giving mail. Somebody else doesn't want to fund that. The concern is well, one set of voters is getting a better opportunity to return the ballot than another. So we th working with the secretary of state, and she got with the governor. They were able to come up with a grant program. So this fall. The, every one of the counties in Washington, except one, I think, chose not to, have a grant to help with the, the business reply mail. And the reason for that is, surprisingly, is that Washington State does not pay for their fair share of elections in even years. This is a cost that's going to end up being passed on to the voters. Eventually. Eventually. Yeah. So after this cycle, uh, and once we've uh, used all those grant funds that we received from the state for business reply mail. Then it'll be a cost of the election, just like I buy, you know, 200,000 envelopes and those. Mm -hmm. All that things will be the cost, it'll be filtered in, and the jurisdictions will ultimately be paying for it. So at least we get some break. The state wants us to do the, the business reply mail, so they gave us the grants, however, it's a one-time only. It's for the it's primary and for the general for, for this, this year, year only. <clears throat> and then next and year, you'll, yeah. In two years from now, hopefully by then we'll convince the legislature the state should be paying their fair share all the time. And then it'll just be a, another cost of the election. If this, um, if, if the postage return fell on your shoulders as the Chelan County Auditor, do you have any idea how much this would have cost you? And in, in you don't buy stamps, but <laughs> we don't buy. Stamps. You don't go down to the post office and no, say, "I'd like seventy thousand stamps, please." No, but how much would this cost you? Do you know? Well, the the rate on on bulk mail works out. Excuse me, on business reply mail, mm -hmm. it's still first class postage, plus some. And so I was just right now it'll run a. With first class postage being right around 50%, 50 cents, it's an additional eight cents to go through the process, will be 58 cents. That 58 cents will work out to about $4,000 if we kept the same ratio of people who use drop boxes and people who mailed just those people instead of putting a stamp on you as the mm -hmm. business reply. We're probably looking at three to $4,000. What we'll see, and my concern is, and it's, it's a concern for tax dollars, well, now that we have this reply mail, why bother using the Dropbox? Well, that makes sense. Sure, absolutely. You just throw it back in the mail. Well, each time you do that, you've cost the county, uh, fire district, school, it, it's tax dollars you're spending. So we'll still have the Dropboxes. We'll still be using them if, the, if, if it's convenient. Certainly, use a drop box as you're saving your tax dollars. Mm -hmm. um, if, if there's something else in the process and you can't get the one and you want to drop it in the mail, obviously do that. You don't need to put a stamp on Or if you put a stamp on it, you're saving postage as well. Or, excuse me, you're saving tax dollars because mm -hmm. a stamp is going to be less than business supply. Yeah, it seems kind of silly if that, well, this is a grant, as you mentioned before, mm -hmm. so the, the state's paying for this, but if the, if the county has to pay for it, uh, moving forward next year, and you you don't have to pay to mail it back, and you use the Dropbox anyway, you've just cost the county fifty eight cents. Yeah, right. Okay. It, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it, it, that's exactly what it is cause, because we're still going to have Dropboxes out mm -hmm. there, and those are the most efficient and as far as cost per wise to get the ballots back to the our office. Uh, we I think run. Drop boxes on an average election, one drop box to pick up, take the mail from, open, and, and to service during an election. One drop box is costing us about $1,500 a cycle. Uh, and we run, let's take uh, Chelan, for example. Let's say we run th roughly 3,000 ballots to that drop box on a big election cycle. Mm -hmm. Well, if it was, it's that's right at the break point. You can see there's 1,500, 1,500. Um, however, that's only um, one time. It'll move forward and will migrate away. So we still service a drop box. So it's mm -hmm. the cost of the drop box and the postage, and that'll be the concern. Hopefully, use the drop box. Uh, if, if you have the number at the top of your head, and if you don't, I apologize. What's the ratio of, of registered voters who return their ballots that use the drop box as opposed to put a stamp on it and mail it back? 
70 to uh, seven to three. Th Seventy percent of all our ballots that return uh -huh. come through the drop box. Um, so, yeah. So uh, one, about one third comes back via the mail. Oh, we love our friends at the national post at the at the post office. But if you use the drop box, you know Skip's going to get it. <laughs> you know we're going to get it. There's yeah. no concern um, because uh, it's the postmark, mm -hmm. and that's what we use. And if we don't have the postmark shown on the day of election, then we can run into issues, and your ballot may not be counted. So have you already started the budgetary process for the 2019 election cycle, assuming that postage is going to come out of your pocket and our pocket? For well, it, it's, I, I've started the process as far as my expenditures. However, in, in 19, that'll be the, the odd years. There'll be no county, really no county voting per se, mm -hmm. or they won't be responsible for any bills. It'll be all the other jurisdictions. But that's where it's going to get interesting is that I build this out. So... This has added a cost to every school, fire, mosquito district. Every one of those are going to see an increased cost if there's a mad rush to uh, uh, use the business for plan mail. It's yep, just, another, another unfunded mandate. The state says you must do this, Skip, and we're not going to give you a dime to do it. That's the, that's, that's that's the, the way yep. it works out. Uh, four laws were passed during the most recent legislative session that wrapped up last spring. Uh, and we'll start with these because I want your, sure. want your thoughts on this and you can explain to people about that. First of all, AVR, automatic voter registration is now a law that's in the books. Talk about that. We're, we're working to a process where voter, excuse me, election age eligible non-registered voters mm -hmm. in essence will be automatically registered to vote and it will be through the uh, driver's license process. The, the thing that we're trying to work out there um, to ensure that only s citizens are registered through that process is trying to work out a, uh, a real idea, as it were, in Washington State. Washington State's one of the, uh, maybe the only at this time, uh, state whose driver's license is, requires a waiver for us to use a Washington State driver's license to get on airlines. Mm -hmm. It's right. not a legal as far as the feds are concerned, the federal government's concerned, of uh, it's not proof of citizenship. It doesn't it, show citizenship. It just shows you can drive a car. Presence. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, and that's the determination, and that's one of our concerns with this. Uh, as we move forward with automatic voter registration, is making sure that we use only systems that ensure that we're re automatically registering uh, citizens. I had a gentleman in the in the office just the other day who was going through the path to citizenship, but found out he'd re he was registered to vote. Wow. He got in, got a driver's license. Uh -huh. At the time of getting issued his driver's license, he must have either didn't understand or, or wound up he was registered. So he came into our office, so we canceled him in our office, made affidavits and showed that he had not participated in any elections, because, yes. That's because, a relief, yeah. But see, it was something he didn't mm -hmm. actively do, or to his knowledge didn't actively do, but he ended up registered. So that's an issue. And we're working on that in, in ways to make that a better process. Election day registration. You can go yes. in on election day, register to vote, and get a provisional ballot. Talk about that. That's now yes. in the books. That was, that's one that has been, um, we've been working on for, geez, 15 years, as long, almost as long as I've been doing elections. And there again, we, we have always been concerned with timeliness between counties. You have somebody that's registered already in one county, which vote by mail environment, so the ballots go out early. What if somebody wanted to run to another county mm -hmm. and cast a ballot? Concern there was our system being able to handle that traffic on almost a real-time basis, and we're, we're, we're real close to that. We have, um, our system's more robust than it used to be 15 years ago, electronically speaking, and we worked out procedures where we can communicate between counties. So when someone comes in and says, I'd like to register today and vote, there will be a process, we have a process in that we can look on whether or not they register someplace else whether or not they return that ballot someplace else. And if, that, and if that's the case, then we will hold their ballot. But we'll still, it'll be a, as we get going, it'll be still kind of a provisional ballot thing. Mm -hmm. They'll register, they'll <coughs> vote a ballot. 
We'll hold it in abeyance a wee bit to ensure that it's vetted and that to make sure it's not two votes in one state is what we're going to be looking for. And I can, I've, I've personally witnessed this. I voted at Skip's office, uh, I can't remember what election it was, and a gentleman came in and said, uh, I think I'm registered, I'm not sure. <laughs> right. And you gave him a provisional ballot, right. he voted, and then you segregated that ballot, and you obviously you took his identification, all mm -hmm. that stuff, that way you could determine um, whether he was in fact a registered voter sure. and was eligible for that election cycle because he couldn't come in on Wednesday and vote. I mean. Right, and <coughs> you, can't, you can't do it the next day, they're there. And what, the one thing about that is too, is we also are in communication back with the voter. They have the opportunity to know exactly how that worked out, whether or not we accepted or, or denied the ballot based and for what reason. So that's a great thing about it. Yeah, if there's any question at all, uh, Skip and his fine crew really, you go out of your way to, to, to oh. talk to the voter and say whatever the case may be. We're there, that's, that's we're, we, we, we approach it as we want to do everything that we can legally mm -hmm. to make sure that a person gets an opportunity to vote. Uh, third law that was passed, uh, pre-registration for 16 and 17 year olds as they get closer to their 18th birthday. Walk us through that. Yes, that, that was one that uh, the concern was um, how to get the younger folks voting and the thought was in that uh, the sooner you register them or the opportunity they're exposed to registration may carry over into actually casting a ballot when they're 18. And so that process worked to driver's license. You normally get your uh, mm -hmm. your permit and you start wandering through DOL at that point in time when you're 16, 17 year old. We already can register directly at, at DOL. So this was just an extension of that. When it first came out, there was concern. Again, this, this is something that's been working for the year, for several years, is again, interconnectivity between the, our offices and holding the data. Auditors were really concerned that now that we've got these youngsters, I mean, they're basically by law, they're still children at 16 and 17 in our database. And our concern was segregating their, them out of the system, but still having them active enough in the system that we don't forget to send them a ballot later on mm -hmm. and activate them. And that was a concern. We think we've got that pretty well worked out with the new system we're putting in place. And again, we're far better technology-wise than we were 10 years ago in our system. So, And if, and if you're in the system, uh, however you got in the system, most of it the Department of Licensing, when you turn 18 and you live in Chelan County or anywhere, you get a nice little letter from Skip that well, says, hey, hey happy, happy birthday. You are now eligible to participate in the democratic process, and this is how you go about registering to vote. You make it easy. It, it's, it's, very, it's quite easy, and you can go online anywhere. Uh -huh. I mean, wherever you are, go online, you can register to vote. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we always have to ask you this, Skip. Um, turnout, what do, you, what do you think? How are you feeling about it? There's a uh, lot of decisions I, there's, to be there's made a, here. It, you know, I, I was, again, when, when we talked yesterday, and I, I started looking at this ballot again, and I do apologize for the size of the ballot. It's, <laughs> it's, a, it's, big it's, it's, it's a large <laughs> piece of paper. Uh, well, there's 29 candidates that filed for the senator race. Who would have, who would have thought? And then we, honestly, when we first started seeing these names start popping in, we started looking at our voter registration system, I mean, excuse me, our tabulation system, and our, we build our own ballots, and we're like, can we even put that many in one column? <laughs> or the concern was, is this going to be a column that wrapped? We got lucky and got them all in one column. You did. To avoid uh, confusion, because if it wrapped, uh -huh. people sometimes think it's a different race, and then, so, but we got them all in one, so turnout. I'm thinking we're going to probably be around 60%, not as high as I'd like to be. Um, and the, the primaries tend to not be a lot of activity, but we've got some, we've got some large races and they're going to be, you know, they're important, all the races are important, but we're talking about a U.S. Senator, we're talking about one of our U.S. Representatives, when you've got 29 in one and 12 in another, I'm thinking of 60 is, I guess that's the realistic number. I would love to see 80%, but that's the number we don't see very often. I know I've asked you this before, and I'm gonna ask you this again. Vote by mail increases or decreases turnout. More people vote since we went to a vote by mail statewide or not? It doesn't seem to have. Okay. It, it doesn't seem to really, it's, it's very difficult, but what, what, what I found in all the research and the looking into balance and voter turnout and everything, what makes a difference is what's on the ballot. 
That's what determines whether or not people participate. If it's an issue that's very close to them or very important to them, they make sure they get involved. If there's things on the, if there's, it seems to be just a, a vanilla ballot, as it were, a benign mm -hmm. ballot, then there may not be a lot of participation, but issues on the ballot. And I'm thinking 29 folks running for Senator, 12 for uh, Representative, we've got what, uh, four yeah, in our five commissioner people running for, uh, or five, yeah. Yeah, five there. Five in the commissioner yeah. race. Four Two people in, running for Mike Steele's position. Mike, yeah. yeah, there's Three a lot there. going on so, here. There's a, it's important because it goes back to it's a top two primary. Yeah. This is, if you don't participate in the primary, you're not making a choice on, other people are deciding who you get to choose come November. Uh -huh. At least this way, if you participate in the primary, you're choosing who you're going to vote for. And which brings up to our second one, um, obviously two or more, or three or more candidates, you got to whittle it down, as Kip said, to the top two who move on to the general election, and yet there are people on the ballot, candidates on the ballot, who are already going to advance to the November general election, regardless of what happens on August 7th, and yet they're, they're on the primary they're ballot. The prim you know, what, the, and the obvious question is, why are they there? If one person filed, why is that person on the primary <coughs> ballot? You know that person's going to the general election. There's two, two thoughts on that, or two ideas behind that. And the primary one is, no pun intended, the main one is that it's a partisan office. Any office that's partisan by law must be on the primary ballot regardless of the number of candidates. The secondary part is, or actually there's three prongs to this, there's discussion. The reason that is is uh, partisan offices need to be filled quicker based just on law, the way the law works. The next election and not the next um, election for that office, you conduct a partisan race. So. In an off year, you can have a partisan race if there's a vacancy. So there's that, the timeliness. The other one is the desire to, and I just lost my thought. Kind of a popularity oh, contest. Oh, well, it's, it's yeah. to get a poll out of it, yes. Yeah. And <clears throat> it just came back to me, is ballot access. The concern is you only have one candidate. If you don't have the primary, somebody can't step up and say, wait a minute, there's only one running. I'm going to run a, a writing campaign. That if you don't have the primary, mm -hmm. that's still an opportunity, but not until November. So. Uh, we got about two minutes left. Give us some important dates that voters need to know about uh, getting their ballot in. Obviously, August seventh. Uh, say for you're turning 18 between August and November, you can get registered. You, if you're not registered stuff. right now, if you're not registered in the state of Wa anywhere in the state of Washington, you're still eligible to vote or as eligible to vote and register. You have you have up until the Eight days prior to the election. That date, I can't remember. So that would be what? July 31st? That'd be, yeah, yeah, that would be July 31st. That's July correct. 31st. Yep. You can still, yeah, uh, we've, we've gone be asked uh, online and not online yet. We're closed, but you have to do it in person. So come into the auditor's office right. and we can register there. Uh, the other part will be August 7th is the primary. Those ballots are going to have to be in a drop box by 8 p.m. on August 7th, or they're going to have to have a postmark. August 7th or obviously earlier for us to count them. Uh, I love talking to Skip, but we're going to close out with a very sobering number. There's about 73,000 people who call Chelan County home. You eliminate the people who aren't eligible to vote because they're not old enough yet, or they're a convicted felon or whatever. You take those out of the mix, and then you go down to the people who are actually eligible to vote in Chelan County as opposed to those who are registered to vote, and it's a big difference. There's a lot of people who can vote, participate in the process, and they don't even bother to register. They don't register. Yeah, that's a, and what ends up happening there is the scary part is we're talking roughly 73,000 um, people, uh, residents. We've got uh, 43,000 registered voters. Um, there's probably about 55,000 or so that are eligible or election age eligible to vote, register. So, and then when you take turnout into play, you're talking, all these decisions are made, about 20,000 people make these decisions. That is an alarming and figure. And that's, that's unfortunate. We need more people to I agree 100%. But if there's good news, there's a lot of people who say, I think I can make a difference and I'm going to run for public office and 
And here you go. They're involved. Uh, if, you don't, if you haven't done your homework yet, the Voter's Guide is available online. It's yes. very simple. Just Google Washington State Voter's Guide. It'll come up. It's a PDF. You can read about the issues. Get your ballot into Skip. Skip, my friend. Take care, my friend. Certainly. Always great. good to see you. Great I am off here. next week, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.